delighted to be here this morning. I'm glad I made it. And um, yeah, I've heard this is a very friendly crowd, so um, I hope you won't mind. I'm, I'm going to use some of my notes. Um, it was a long, long couple of days of travel. But um, yeah, really quickly, Chris Matthews, I'm on the global education team. My, my team, just to give you a sense, uh, we often work with, with customers uh, in really intimate engagements to help them on a product acceleration, engagement acceleration, and really driving innovation. Um, a lot over the last two years uh, revolving around generative AI and data and insights. Um, and then my team also supports uh, and helps our partners think about global market expansion um, and new market entry and cloud economics. And so we do a number of different things with, with our customers around the world. And I have a video uh, that I wanted to play to get us started. So if we could do that, that'd be great. I need to master the, apparently, the clicker here. Um, OK. Um, yeah, so I, I think for I, I, one of the things I wanted to do is just kind of a little talk about what we're seeing as far as trends, insights uh, around generative AI. Um, I'll end with, with a number of uh, kind of use cases that we're seeing across industry. Um, some pulled from education, but some from other highly regulated industries that I think we'll see some of the real innovation that generative AI is helping companies drive and having real impact on their customers, their businesses. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of breeze through those at the end as well. But in 2023, um, we sort of look at it as the, the year of the POC. What we were hearing from uh, a lot of our, our customers, partners, was that yeah, they were focused on learning and understanding uh, generative AI and this sort of seemingly transformational technology. So we would often get questions about just what is generative AI, where do we get started, what's a foundational model, what's an FM, um, and but also you know this proof of concept sort of phase wasn't uncommon for some of our customers to, to do tens of them and even hundreds and in some cases thousands. And but we really we saw a, a real transition. Uh, into 2024 and um, what I often title sort of this year of, of production. Um, so we saw that you know, a lot of our customers and partners sort of transition from proof of concepts with really a production mindset, starting to think about areas of compliance, governance, responsible AI, uh, and really start to also dig into the sense of return on investments, so that production mindset it really changed around how we unlock this potential of generative AI and drive tangible business impact. So the questions for us started to shift around how can I lower my costs? How do I make this real and tangible and authentic for our customers uh, and our end users? Uh, how do I manage those risks? So these are a lot of the same questions that we're getting from our customers and what we're hearing around the world. And, um, and we think we'll probably continue into, into 2025. Um, so how do we see <clears throat> generative AI evolving at the moment? Well, for us, there's a number of sort of, sort of key sort of trends and themes that we're seeing around the world. Is 
rapid advancement in model quality and speed and cost efficiency. I think every month, perhaps every fortnight, there's a new updated model that's coming out. Um, that task decomposition, uh, really the optimization of processes and enhancing overall model performance and application performance, as well as the sort of broadening ecosystem of, of tools and applications. So we see that continuing to mature uh, around the world. And, and I think one of the most interesting things for me is that enhanced precision uh, and enhanced inference that you're seeing in the models to really generate those predictable outputs, not just coming from some of the, the you know, sort of trained models from, you know, obviously from data, structured, non-structured data coming from the internet, but the opportunity to really train and fine tune those models based on, on your data and be able to drive much more predictable outputs and better inferences. So I really quickly, I think we all at this point probably know that generative AI is powered by these big foundational models. Um, yeah, I think the two most interesting things here for, for me is that the opportunity to apply generative AI in these wide range of contexts, and that's starting to come by domain-specific generative AI models, the opportunity to customize those foundational models with your data, and your data being your IP, and that's what makes generative AI and the applications that you develop really special, and being able to develop those for very domain-specific tasks. So wh what are we seeing in terms of you know, generative AI, in terms of like use cases? So this is just a picture of some of the most common ones in terms of generative AI ushering in new opportunities for customers and for partners across the education spectrum, regardless if they're startups or enterprise uh, you know, partners. And some of the ones that are, are most interesting for me in terms of the trends is we're, we're starting to finally move away from chatbots and virtual teaching assistants to much more sophisticated uh, use cases and, and the application of, of generative AI foundational models. And so I'll talk through some of the use cases at the end, but the opportunity to really drive hyper-personalized learning in K-12, in higher ed, and in, and in skilling and upskilling context, but the opportunity to really generate these rich new content and um, uh, coming from a background from uh, the media side, um, in some cases uh, I'm wowed by you know what we're able to see, and I'll show a few pictures I took. I used some of the models today to actually generate content, um, and so that advancement that we're seeing just in the three the last three to six months is really unprecedented. Um, but we're seeing use cases across the spectrum of uh, you know, operational, administrative both for and higher ed in the, in the case of libraries, research institutions, and across the, the athletic spectrum. So I mentioned that, uh, so six months ago, I took a picture using uh, stable diffusion um, just to see what I could get. And, and then this morning, um, I did the same, uh, same text. Diff slightly different model um, from Stable Diffusion XL to SD3 Ultra. Um, but you can really see the, the difference in terms of the quality of content generation uh, in still imagery. And so what I love about this is the opportunity of how fast generative AI is moving and the opportunity of what we're seeing from some of our partners to really create hyper-personalized content and high-quality content across the domain spe specificities. Should, the video should play, but um, I, mean, I, also, I also did this this morning and tried to generate a video. And so that rapidly improving generative AI media, I think we still have a, a little ways to go when we're, when we're talking about voice, music, and video generated from text. Um, I apologize, the, the generated video isn't playing, but, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> but I think what's, what's really interesting, again, is this move and the shift to really high quality uh, you know, voice and video generated text uh, and the opportunity from what we see going forward. But that's not to say that we don't have challenges, um, all the benefits of generative AI. Um, this is a period of, of discontinuous flux and change and you know, I think that's, that can be challenging and disruptive uh, to your businesses, to the industry and the sector. And, 
Uh, we're also seeing a lot of, of consumer-facing applications that are really meant for enterprise problems. So we're seeing a lot of applications based on generative AI being pushed into the market, um, but not having thought through the use cases, their customers, and the benefits. And so really thinking about how that, that development roadmap and that strategy roadmap to ensure that the applications you're developing are really intended for consumers and have clear use cases in mind. So, and we see a little bit too much reliance on foundational models alone to solve these problems. I think there is that, that natural need to have that interaction between the models and humans. Um, and data quality. I'll cover that just a little bit, but it's really critical uh, to be able to have your data stack, uh, that is your IP, that's your differentiator, but to be able to pull directly from your data to be able to refine and fine tune these models um, is, is really important. So that inaccessibility, that uh, unintegrated data and the poor quality of data that of some of the organizations that um, we have conversations with and are helping them through that progression of how to use and deploy generative AI, we start from the basis of, of data. Where is your data? Uh, how integrated is it into the business, and, um, and is it structured? Is it a data lake or, or a data warehouse so that you have it systematically alongside the generative AI application to be able to deploy? And then again, I mentioned not, not aligning use cases to strategic priorities. Uh, of course, Goldman Sachs put out this report, and I think that's on top of mind for a lot of folks is generative AI, the spend versus the return on investment. And, uh, I'll share some of the use cases um, at the end of this uh, slide. Uh, and I think we're still in the really early days when it looks at like the, the key metrics of how you are evaluating generative AI. And I think that's okay. Um, but we are seeing some real operationally focused metrics that are showing transcendence and the ability to really have impact within the organization. I think those opportunities to see those metrics with students uh, and their academic progress their, and developments of, of new skills and upskilling and reskilling. I think it, it's going to take us a little time to get there, and I think that's okay. And I think we have to remember that we're still two years, you know, maybe three years into this journey. Uh, and so the ability for us to be able to continue to think about how are we measuring and what metrics are we using um, to really look at the return on investment uh, in terms of the front end and the back end. Just really quickly about uh, Amazon, how do we help? I mean, I truly believe that, that generative AI will be woven into uh, all of our applications going forward. We're not there yet. I think we all need to lean in together and learn from each other. And, and you know, Amazon's bedrock service really helps simplify the process for you to build, train, tune, and deploy you know, your AI models. Um, so we really think there are four big differentiators in terms of how Amazon uh, Bedrock Service can really simplify your AI journey. It's choice is the first, and I think this choice um, is really important because we, we believe that, that no model will rule them all. Um, like I said, we're still in the early days of generative AI. These models are going to continue to evolve at unprecedented levels. Um, we're going to see a diverse set of use cases, and those diverse set of use cases require a diverse set of models, and that's why for us that you know, we want customers to be able to have the flexibility to choose different models at different times uh, to, pick what, uh, to pick the right model aligned to your use case. And that ties in for us in terms of customization and be able to provide our customers with a rich set of tools and services to be able to, to customize your model development. Of course, integration into the rest of the things you're doing from compute, data and analytics, security, and then the last piece for us, the responsible AI. Uh, Amazon is, is really leading on responsible AI. It's critically important to us. We have eight pillars of, of responsible AI I'll show a quick slide on. Um, but that is first and foremost for us, along with security, as we think about the types of services and applications we provide and the model choice so that you can drive application development and solutions for your customers uh, based on the use cases that you identify. So really, I think I'll just uh, quickly on this slide, I think what questions should an AI strategy answer for you? I mean, I'm somewhat agnostic. When I think about a strategy and what that needs to look like, um, I think it varies obviously from company to company and organization to organization. 
But I think that any organization that is making big investments in AI should be able to answer you know, certain questions, and that's why um, across these four categories, and that's why I bundle these together. And I think you've got to dig deeply on, on product, on your use case, to really have a clear identification of what are your goals, what are you trying to solve for, the data. Where is your data? How is it, how is it stored? Um, is it structured? Is it unstructured? Is it within a data warehouse? Is it living in silos? How are you pulling that together? Of course, your technology stack, and I think just organizationally to ensure that there is a you know, sync across the organization in terms of how AI can potentially transform your business and how you plan to use it uh, integrated within your organizational strategy and structure. Oops. There we go. Um, well, I mentioned earlier, I think this uh, you know, data, data, data for us, and that really drives your business and how we look at helping you understand your business, your customers, your products, your operations. It's only possible um, when you own your data um, and when you are be able to use your data to improve and customize the models so that they can become unique to generating content and generating applications and services um, so that your organization owns that IP. Um, and that path is part of really being able to truly differentiate the high value experiences through generative AI. Um, so for us, I mean, just to really quickly, I think this is a really simplified view in terms of the journey that a, a lot of our customers are, are going on. Any good strategist, I think, is going to say, let's start with your business goals. Let's start with your use cases. I think everyone now is really kind of taking a breath and realizing that generative AI isn't going to be a magic bullet. It's going to take time. Um, it takes time to plan. It takes investment uh, to leverage generative AI in ways that, that customers will really uh, adopt and use. Um, but as I mentioned, I think there, it boils down to me to a, a couple of key questions with customers that I, I talk to uh, around the world which, again, how AI can create real customer value, what are the problems you're trying to solve for, and which of these are, are really you, you are, are you as a business, as an organization, uniquely positioned to use AI in a differentiated way? Um, I just met, I, I do work across education, but across industries, uh, other industries as well, and I um, was meeting with a 160-year-old insurance company uh, last week. Um, and they have paper records of essentially uh, life policies going back 60 to 90 years um, that they have on the books, but they're in paper. And they're using generative AI uh, to get a better read on their exposure uh, on a capital base in terms of what they're going to have to pay out over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years uh, as those, obviously those policies come to term. And, you know, that to me is an example of being able to have a clear sense of the use case. They have a clear sort of understanding of we have exposure. They don't really know what that exposure is. They haven't had it before, but they're using generative AI to be able to obviously digitize all of those policies and to be able to predict and look at that next 10 to 20, 30 years of their business and what the potential risk and how they're going to modify you know, the capital structure of their organization um, to be able to address that. I, th I think I'll kind of go through this, but, but I think the best way for us to figure out those biggest opportunities for your business value are to focus on your end users. This could be your employees. It could be, obviously, your, your end users, like students, citizens. Um, how can we save them time by automating tasks? How can we provide them with better answers and insights so they can work smarter, better, more efficiently, more, produ more productively, and helping them make better decisions? Um, so this is sort of a quadrant that we, that we often work with in terms of a working backwards process with a lot of our customers, again, to sort of really dig deep on what are you solving for, who's your audience, who are your users and your end user, and, and what, are, what, what problems are you trying to solve for? Because it really boils down, I think, to, into the weeds of some of those conversations about knowing your end users, knowing your customers enough to be able to make some of those educated guesses in terms of where you're going to deploy uh, your AI investments. Ah, 
Ah, here we go. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I mentioned earlier like, that you know, safety, security, responsible AI is incredibly important um, for Amazon, um, building trust with our customers, our partners, and, and also keeping in mind your customers as well. I think deploying generative AI, building on generative AI in a responsible way is absolutely critical. So we, we have at the moment, and this is constantly evolving for us, but eight pillars of what we look at in terms of those dimensions of responsible AI. I won't go into these. Um, I told them I would only take 20 minutes. So, But I, I think these, you know, sort of self-explanatory, I'm happy to dig into to them in more deeper, but I think just quickly, you know, fairness, explainability, the safety, preventing harm so that your system output isn't misused, obviously privacy and security for individualized data, protecting that data, protecting your models, governance, transparency. Um, so these are the, the eight uh, sort of pillars that we provide support and services on within Bedrock, within our other services, as you look at building your framework for responsible AI and looking at deploying, again, and fine-tuning those models. So in the end, I think there are, there's just a, there are a lot of considerations. We kind of boil them down in our conversations to just a few big ones, but qualifying your use case, really prioritizing which model, evaluating the different models so that you're choosing the right model aligned to your use case that's going to provide you with the best output um, scale. We want to be able to help you know, to move beyond a single use case and a single proof of concept to ensure there's benefits across the business, um, both again internally and externally as you look at scale and return on investment, data, safety, security, Again, I know I've mentioned this before, but data is your IP, and keeping that safe and secure uh, is critically important, and that's one of those big considerations we focus on. And then relevancy and accuracy of the data and the output um, so that your customers trust, continue to trust your brand, rely on you, and I think that's the, the focus for us as well as we look at those considerations in the, the responsible AI framework. Well, I'll go through a few of these really quickly, but... Um, I promise to share just a kind of a, a number of use cases, uh, partners and customers that we work with, how they're deploying generative AI and some of the outcomes that they're seeing. So there's a, a number of these that are across industry. Um, quite a few are, are education specific. Um, Thomson Reuters, I'm sure a number of you are, are familiar with them, but we worked with their team to, to develop um, what they called an open arena, which is really a playground to freely interact with LLMs in a, in a controlled environment. And I think that they, the big challenge they were trying to solve for is just being able to explore and innovate across the entire organization. So making AI solutions accessible across their technical and non-technical teams. But the, you know, the outcomes that they're starting to see, and again, early days on this in terms of, again, operational OPEX uh, improvements, productivity efficiency, streamlining of testing and innovation for them. And, they see it as fueling innovation across the entire company and in their organization. Okay, yeah. Um, Smile and Learn, it's a, 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 one of the largest Latin American ed tech companies and publishers around the world, uh, headquartered in Madrid. Um, and we worked with them because they wanted to explore and innovate across their organization to produce content faster and at scale. Um, so a couple of the outcomes that they've seen 90% cost reduction in, in their audiobook assets, 80% reduction in translation costs, uh, increase in accessibility features, and an increase in content creation. Uh, Pfizer, um, I think most people are, are familiar with Pfizer, but I mean, as an organization, we supported them in looking at how do we accelerate the pace of production to make life-saving medication and accessibility to patients worldwide and to be able to improve that development cycle to the point where they're seeing a predicted cost savings annually of nearly a billion US dollars. Just one more on the note. So UCLA, um, we worked with uh, the, their Anderson School of Management to accelerate alumni engagement. One of the challenges they came to us with is they lose contact with their alumni once they graduate from the university. They wanted to innovate and accelerate how they approached alumni, how they drove engagement, ultimately as the output to, to fundraise and how they solve for that. And 
Um, so we supported them in, in building out a number of ways to help use AI to personalize the whole funding ecosystem and the funding cycle for the university and increase that alumni engagement um, post-graduation. So they're seeing an increase across that sort of number of marketing metrics in terms of opening email rates, click-through rates, but ultimately they're seeing 130% improvement in endowment fundraise in the first year. I'll just stop there. I have a lot of other use cases I can share, but I think I appreciate the time. And you will be around? So yeah, yeah, great. absolutely. Yeah, great. Lovely. So thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you very much. Very interesting. <laughs>